Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're talking about adapting to and healing climate change with Angela Churi Kahaga, Executive Vice President for Impact at Environmental Defense Fund. So, uh, Angela, thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you. And we are today living through climate change and its aftermath. We're seeing these huge impacts on an international basis, not only in the coastal areas of the United States, but inland where we're experiencing decades long droughts. We're, we're seeing snowpacks that are not reaching the, the levels that they, that they should. Internationally, we're seeing floods uh, across Pakistan and Bangladesh. We're seeing the sub-Saharan African famines that are metastasizing. We're seeing climate change driven migrations of people. Could you talk a little bit about your view from the Environmental Defense Fund on climate change and how that has affected your work? Because initially when you were founded, you weren't focused on climate change, but now so much of what you're doing really does have to do with that impact that humans have had over the last uh, hundreds of years. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And it is indeed a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, yes, climate change right now is, I think, a defining crisis of our time. Um, 30 years ago, when you know the conversation started about climate change, it tended to be limited among a limited, should I say, uh, constituency of experts, mainly the meteorologists and some environmental, environmentalists. But as the impacts are becoming more and more evident, it becomes clear that this is not something that could be dealt with on its own on the side. Um, at EDF, we have been in the business of environmental advocacy and research for a very long time. And over the years, we have seen that uh, climate change is affecting all aspects of society. It's affecting how we manage our land resources, how we manage our fisheries and our oceans. Um, it actually also is affecting how businesses um, go about their, their operations. So we recently went through um, an institutional, should I say, reorg, where we looked at everything we've been doing and tried to factor in climate um, risk and climate opportunity across everything we, we do. So we are essentially all in on climate. And why we do, sorry. The, the thing that I've always found very interesting about Environmental Defense Fund is that you have focused on uh, outcomes for the environment, but you are very, very practical, not doctrinaire at all in terms of how you go about your business. So I have seen EDF uh, collaborating with business interests that some environmentalists will, would view as as in opposition to an environmental agenda, but EDF has has had a lot of collaborations across different boundaries of tradition within movements to create uh, um, some sort of, of discrete outcome that benefits the environment. How is that um, informing your work? How does that approach inform your work when it comes to climate change? Well, I think our, our philosophy in all of that is that you cannot address climate change with only one part of society or one part of business. Uh, we need everyone involved. And that also includes um, sectors of business um, that traditionally would not be the front line of environmental steward stewardship. Um, we believe that... Um, while there are some companies and there are some organizations that are way out there, they're doing great work in this regard. There are others who are struggling um, and others where the incentives to act are not as huge. And using uh, the approach um, that, of course, characterizes our work across the board, you know, working from a point of what does the science say and what are some of those opportunities? figuring out what is the value of engaging in these opportunities and how do we do this together, we're then able to try and build not only an economic, a social and a political case for why or for the opportunity to act fully, um, you know, should I say, recognizing that 
you know, for, if we don't act, then the risks are immense. So by taking a broader encompassing um, approach to engaging with stakeholders across all walks of life, across all sectors, we hope to be able to really mobilize at least a critical mass of stakeholders who will pave the way for an all of society um, transition towards a more climate resilient future. In many cases, are you trying to shift the incentives to incentivize behaviors across these different sectors, whether it's government behaviors or business behaviors or even individual behaviors? Are you trying to shift the incentives so that we are incentivized in the short term to work in our long term interest as opposed to making our short term interest, for, for example, for pursuit of profit, oppositional? to our long-term interest. Um, Is that part of this? Because to heal the climate, to heal the damage that we've done is going to be a century or even more. Uh, It's going to be a a long-term endeavor. If if our incentives for the short term are oppositional to our long-term welfare, we're kind of doomed. is, Is that part of your approach? Absolutely. And I mean, I could not have said it better. Um, We have a tendency, I mean, when I say we, I mean collectively, to focus on the long term goal, whether it is 2030 or 2050. And rightfully so. We should know where we're heading because we know that if we don't reach that target, you know, things are not going to be, um, things will not look the way they do right now. Things will be heading towards a catastrophic future. But to get there, you have to take the first steps. You have to think about what can we already be doing today that will start charting the way to the future. So we have been approaching this by not only understanding where what are those points that you know we're setting our sights on, but what are those steps we can do now. So, for example, some of the work we're doing around methane um, and bringing attention to the big opportunity managing global methane emissions has for driving down um, global emissions, given that this is a much more potent gas than carbon dioxide, and trying to direct attention to what could be done today with existing technologies really creates opportunity for us to at least gain some ground in slowing down um, global warming. And, And part of this has to do with, just sort of to remind our viewers, part of this has to do with Methane is positioned as a comparatively, uh, among fossil fuels, is positioned in the market as being a fairly clean fuel. However, the mining, the extraction of methane itself, creates so many different problems with methane emissions that we end up with, in aggregate, not necessarily such a clean picture, right? It's not as if methane um, magically ends up in tanks. The the whole process, the, the, the value chain, includes a lot of emissions. And you can actually see it now through satellite imaging where those methane emission hotspots are with very often uh, center around uh, those extraction uh, facilities. How, uh, using that as an example, what are you doing in, in methane in order to inform people and help them also adjust their, their behaviors surrounding the extraction use and reliance on methane? Uh, just Just since you mentioned that as a, as a topic? Well, first, I mean, um, right now, if you look at the current situation, um, you know, gas utility lines and companies around the world, we're seeing a release of close to 75 million metric tons a year of methane. Now, if this was gas that was captured in use, that could produce significant amount of electricity um, for, for example, the con- for Africa um, twice over. What we have been doing, found is that I think the problem is not as well understood, especially from the oil and gas sector, in terms of how large these emissions are, where they're coming from, and how the, where can we have the biggest reductions done, um, especially within the immediate short term, and then, of course, over time. Mm-hmm. So we are um, going to be launching a satellite, we call it Methane Sat, which will provide high-precision global coverage um, of data that could be used to make those decisions um, around where we should be looking to cut those emissions and where we should be looking to capture the gas. In addition to that, we're also looking at uh, methane emissions from agriculture. 
um, which is also a huge sector producing uh, methane. And but looking at that in the context of also how to promote climate smart agricultural practices, um, given that presently agriculture also contributes to close to 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And it's a sector that is bound to grow as you know, as we tr- as we seek to feed growing populations around the world. It's, it seems that part of what you're doing is you're taking the part of our value chains, which are socialized. Yeah. In other words, we very often socialize cost, for example, in extraction of methane, right? Yeah. Methane that is released into the atmosphere that now is hurting everyone, right? That's a socialized cost. It's the same thing on the agricultural side. So you're basically now making the socialized cost very uh, transparent, and then you are helping uh, by providing this information people to adjust their behaviors and their production uh, methods in order to reduce the socialized damage of of our own activities. It's 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 bringing awareness. Are you finding that there's resistance? to the to deploying such information or do you find that the information is welcome by those whose whose behaviors if you have this information you're now inclined to change your behaviors do are, are you finding resistance or are you finding acceptance i think there is a growing acceptance because globally we're at a point where there is that recognition of the challenge and the crisis we're in um secondly also because of the approach we take in trying to get the information out um, first of all, when we do not basically go on a singular issue basis, we are trying to work with solutions that solve for more than one problem, which means that we have to contextualize and relate to some of those priorities that different, should I say, stakeholders um, or communities of practice have. Um, and in so doing, we have been able to develop not only partnerships to help us, you know, should I say, socialize these messages, mobilize um the engagement and therefore hopefully trigger the actions that need to be taken. So in essence, I think it's the time we're in in history, there is no time really for resistance, but what's most important is making sure that as we're trying to de- develop the solutions, we're also developing them with other with others and, and basically building them off um, the context within which they would be implemented. So we've talked a little bit about providing information. The next step after providing information is the development of those solutions. Mm -hmm. Talk about how Environmental Defense Fund brings together people to develop solutions and what kind of solutions are in the works right now that that are part of, of the programs that you are deploying. So um, our approach, again, is one that is trying to premise our definition of the problem and the potential solutions in a very objective and robust economics and science um, assessment. And we work very much at that nexus of econ, science, and the policy space. Economics, because, you know, when we understand better what people really value, then we're able to identify what those incentives are. Science, because we need to make sure that these solutions are science-informed, science-based, and science-aligned. We don't want to make things up that don't really relate to the reality, and this helps us have a bit more precision when thinking through what kind of solutions we want to put forward. Well, also, science evidence will tell you whether an investment will have its intended impact. Absolutely. Right? If yes. it's just done on faith, if it's just done on conviction, right, it, it it won't necessarily tie out. It's like any other business, right? You want to have evidence that if you take an action, it will have the intended effect. Yeah. Yeah. And then the part, the last part is, um, or the critical ingredient is the partnerships, working with those stakeholders, whether they're farmers or fishers or policymakers on the Hill, for example, here in the United States, to be able to also bring their perspectives in terms of, what is it that they value and how then can we relate what um, so these solutions, working with them also in defining the solutions. So we have, for example, um, when it comes to small scale fisheries, worked with um, f- fisher communities around the world to identify, um, should I say, 
what good looks like when it comes to managing um, the resources and being part of the process of building up sustainable fishery programs. We have also been working with um, local communities, for example, in the Amazon, including indigenous um, peoples, people group, to understand what good looks like when it comes to forestry investment and translating this back into initiatives such as the LEAF initiative, which is a large scale um, investment in emission reduction in tropical forests, so that these communities become part of the solution and not passive spectators or passive beneficiaries um, when these solutions are then coming into motion. We are working with businesses also to make sure they're also part of these conversations as many of them are seeking outlets to make their investments um, towards emissions reduction. I have a question about messaging. Mm -hmm. We are talking here in paragraphs. Your paragraphs are much better than mine, but you, you end up with a lot of complexity here because the data is rather complex, right? Mm -hmm. And then the conclusions that you need to draw from those from that data, they're rather complex. Talking in paragraphs, talking in chapters, talking in whole papers and books and so on. But we see, on the other hand, in terms of messaging, we see memes and social media extracts and 128 character limits and all these different things that are incredibly powerful. And sometimes we see that the power of these very sh short and convenient bites of sound, even if they're false, those, those memes are more powerful than the whole papers that are being uh, published by science. And so you end up with a falsehood and a truth being given equal weight, or perhaps even the falsehood being given greater weight, greater prominence. How does Environmental Defense Fund ensure that the message that, that you are providing, the importance of what is happening to everyday lives, that that actually is getting out in a way that all of us who are not scientists can really understand and can grasp and can, can get behind? Well, this is where um, our work within our comms department, which basically tries to use multiple channels to reach out to different stakeholders. Again, we leverage on our partnerships because we believe that it's really important to have the right interlocutor when it comes to engaging with communities. And we try to make sure that we back all our messages with the sound research um, and the sound facts so that um, this, if, if, if challenged, can still be responded to, whether from a scientific or an economic point of view. But we are, I think what you've, what you've identified really is a challenge I think everybody's facing because right now, globally, the attention span um, is basically, I think we've come to a point where a Twitter message can determine you know, a full perception of how things work. So even within the social media space, while we do try to condense some of those messages, we do make sure that um, stakeholders can still follow up um, and get more background information. And we also try to make sure we're not communicating only in the very technical and wonky terms, um, because while yes, we do engage a lot with scientists or economists, at the end of the day, they're not the ones we really want to convince if they're the ones generating the work with us. It is to get it to the people who have to live these realities every day. You know, the you and me and our people back home. Um, we are also working with, with the youth through um, different constellations, which is also one very important way of getting them to understand that acting on climate change has to be second nature to them. And so by offering opportunities through internships, through the Climate Core program, it becomes also a way of having them being part of the conversation and also helping us to communicate it out to their peers. In many respects, are you movement building um, through your process in that you're, you've mentioned people who are um, in government, for example, or in business. And presumably those people are older, they they have had careers, and they've reached a certain level. But you then you also mentioned very young people. You mentioned the the uh, the people who fish um, and and uh, and people who are at the lower income uh, levels who perhaps have small family businesses in different countries. Um, are you basically trying to 
um, figure out a way in which you can add information and extract information and share information across different uh, groups and get those ideas, bring them, become a sort of a cross-fertilizing entity, and then build a movement that goes in particular directions so that if there's a government policy, it's helping those those people who fish. It's also helping the people who distribute the fish, the businesses, the consumers who eat the fish, right? Are you are you creating a coalition in many respects through your activities that uh, tend toward a beneficial action for the climate? You could say that what we're doing is through um, the sound research basis and advocating on that we are be, we are trying to empower stakeholders to be able to make informed choices. Um, of course, the more empowered people are in understanding the reality and the opportunity um, that acting on climate change offers um, and the risks of not acting on climate change, we hopefully are building a strong foundation upon which, um, whether it is policy action or other actions can actually be taken. So, but my point here is, is is kind of adjacent to this idea of empowering stakeholders. It seems that you're also creating alignment amongst stakeholders, not in a nefarious or manipulative way, yes. but you're you're trying to show that that stakeholders that in sometimes the traditions of of the environmental or business movement are oppositional. You're. It, it seems that what you're doing is you're trying to to sort of square the circle, bring people together so that from their perspective, they are benefiting themselves while also conveying benefit to others. You know, there's an alignment piece here that I think is quite extraordinary and seems to be a long-term theme yeah. with EDF's whole, whole philosophical approach. Yeah, I should have actually said at the beginning um, that we approach, especially the partnerships, to engage, to empower, and to align and the alignment um, piece, as you have very eloquently um, stated, is we do recognize that we are small. I mean, in the big scheme of things, um, EDF is a small player. But we want to make sure that our contribution is to catalyze um, efforts where, in a way that we are aligned with others, we're able to all strive in the same direction. So, yes, that is indeed a key part of, should I say, um, the philosophy of our approach. Um, seeking ways to partner with others, to work through others, have others, you know, should I say, collaborate with us. It is a way for us to bring out results from our work, but at the same time learn and get feedback on where, you know, we can do better, where we can actually add more value. So it's not a monodirectional that we do the work, we're best and, and everyone else has to follow. It really is a process of mutual development because we do recognize that, we don't have all the answers, but where we can actually play a role in generating answers on our own and with others, and actually with much more emphasis on working with others, um, then we're able to create that critical mass that will actually enable change to happen. I have a question. Because you are the executive vice president for Impact, mm -hmm. uh, there is a an element here that is also about accountability. Yes. Even accountability within your own organization. How do you, if you're going to hold EDF accountable for generating impact, how do you create accountability structures within your organization so that everybody is thinking about their individual impact, their individual accountability for generating impact, that then you on the downstream report to your partners and your constituents? How do you deal with accountability? within your organization? So on one hand, we are, um, we, we have been working since, since the Rio, we have been working on a very robust framework for monitoring um, the, the results. So we have a set of indicators linked to each of the thematic areas we're working, um, which at least help us measure the direction things are moving. We break down those indicators to the program level um, relating it to the objectives of what each of the programs are doing. Um, we do, of course, recognize that, um, again, as I said, being an institution within this huge world of work that needs to be done, 
we cannot claim full attribution for global emissions decreasing by 30%, but we can look and see how the work we're doing is creating trends in that direction, identifying how we collectively can do it with others. So while we do have, of course, the programmatic level outputs that we, of course, seek to achieve, we also monitor how this turn into larger scale outcomes that we can manage together with partners, as well as trying to identify some of those points of critical intervention where the quickest gains can actually be made. We are a very matrix organization, so we work across um, at least the impact pillar, which is where I lead with our teams in the regions and our teams who work to generate the solutions where the Office of the Econom Chief Economist, Chief Scientist um, reside. And in that context, we try to make sure that we are subscribing to a common set of, of goals um, for which those indicators are then um, defined. It's so very interesting. In business, your, uh, your, your final accountability is for profit at the end of a quarter. If you are on the expense side, you're trying to minimize the expense or you're trying to ensure that every uh, expense has the maximum beneficial impact on profit. If you're on the revenue side, you're maximizing the uh, the top line piece. But at the end of the day, everybody is successful. If, if one number, that number of profit is maximized, but you have 20, 30 indicators of success, right? You don't have just one, you have to make sure that your, your resources are well spent. Mm -hmm. And on what? On impact, clean air, clean water, um, the economic life of particular communities, the partnerships that you forge. How do you manage that type of complexity? Well, no, let me just put it this way. We're in the process of trying to manage it, trying to def define a very robust way to do it. We have been trying to also do a translation back in terms of what does this mean in terms of carbon dioxide reduced. Not very easy because much of it is really implied, but at least it gives us an indication of how the needle is moving um, because everything really is working towards trying to reduce the emissions of the carbon dioxide equivalent in the atmosphere and at the same time improving the livelihoods, which to some degree you can um, quantify in terms of income terms and jobs. But the challenge is that there are a lot more qualitative elements that sometimes go unstated if you only focus, focus on that one number. So we do try, we're still trying to work a model that will capture all of this. And I think the way we're doing it, it is because we have all this cross, um, you know, these matrix teams that help us understand, are we building that case? And how is that case, what's the uptake of, of a case for, should I say concerted action? Um, and looking at what results is generating. This is a long-term problem. It's not one that we can write off and say in two years that it's done. It, but what we can see is in terms of the direction and the trends within which things are going. You know, you're making such an important point. The search for simplicity is itself a very sophisticated process, right? Yeah. How do you how do you take what is an enormously complex problem and create? accountability structures, how do you create impact? How do you measure the impact? How do you actually bring people together? It's so, so complicated. And thank you so much, uh, Angela Churi Kalahaga um, of Environmental Defense Fund. Thank you for sharing the work that you're doing, the important work of environmental defense. And thank you so much for your insights. This has just been a wonderful conversation and very informative. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you.